That certainly is a thought-provoking song, if you really think about it. Because we have this one life to live to get ready for that judgment day. And if we're using it in any other way, other than to prepare to meet our Lord in the judgment, then we ought to change so that we are using it to get ready to meet our Lord. This morning we gave the first part of a sermon on how that salvation is in Christ's church. Let me read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 27 where the Apostle Paul said, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. We'll notice more as we go on into this how that that body is the church. And Ephesians 4 says there's only one body. So we're talking about Christians who make up the church. We know from our early, earlier studies in Acts chapter 2 that those that were being saved were added to the church by the Lord himself. Acts 2, 41, 42, and 47. But we live in a world that defines Christianity on the basis of denominationalism. That's all they ever think about the church. And most of them take the position that the church has not one thing in the world to do with your salvation. Yet we've just seen that these people at Corinth who had heard and believed the gospel, if you look over just a chapter or two later, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, you see what Paul says, they had heard, believed, and obeyed, knowing the gospel is the power of God to save, Romans 1, 16. And they were added to the church, and they made up the church at Corinth, as the New Testament teaches, it's organized. And he says, now ye are members of the body of Christ, and are now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. So what does that do to the idea that it doesn't make any difference what church uh, you are a member of? And most of them will tack this on just so you're sincere in whatever you believe. Well, it's because they are simply trying to defend a system that is foreign to the New Testament. A system that upholds division among believers in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.10 makes it clear. Notice that's in the same letter I just read the other from. That we are to be of the same mind and the same judgment. Let there be no divisions among you. So we are to be joined together in our beliefs because we have one New Testament of Christ, then there's one source of teaching. And it doesn't say one thing to you and one thing to somebody else and one thing to me and so on down the line and it all means different things. And if you're sincere in believing each one of those things is the truth, then you're all right with God. That destroys the very concept of what truth really is and everything the Bible teaches. So they must have in mind just simply the denominational concept of the church to ever say that it doesn't make any difference what church you're a member of. Because if you're talking about man-made churches, then it doesn't make any difference which one you're a member of. Because none of them are founded by Jesus Christ himself. He built his church, Matthew 16, 18. And he doesn't do anything without a reason. And when in Acts 2 we see that he added all those uh, who were saved from their sins to his church, which he purchased with his blood, Acts 20 and 28, then salvation is in Christ's church. You'll never hear somebody who says the Bible is the word of God. Then turn over to Genesis 6 and say there were people saved from the flood outside the ark. Yet that's a shadow of the church to come. Genesis 6, 8, no found grace in God's sight. Then the plan of salvation is given and how the ark is to be built and out of what is to be built. And then his faith is seen in verse 22. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And that is in harmony with James 2, that it wasn't a dead faith, but it was a living, active, obedient faith, whereby he built the ark according to the authority of God. 
Yet that ark wouldn't have been worth anything if he hadn't found grace in God's sight. So there is a system of salvation revealed to God because God loves all of us. We don't deserve it. We can't merit it. He favors us with it. But it requires on my part my proof that I love him and that I have faith in him and his system. And thus I must be obedient. That's the only way I can show my faith. As James said, show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. Just say in your mind, well, I'm going to show everybody, including God, that I love him, but I'm not going to keep any of his commandments. Doesn't that sound ridiculous? Or I'm going to demonstrate my great faith, trust, belief, and confidence in God and his system of salvation as revealed in the Bible, but I'm not going to keep a commandment that he tells me to keep. Well, that's the very thing James is writing against. He's saying, you can admit all this in your mind, but when you don't comply with what the Lord said, your faith is dead. A living faith is one that takes God at his word and complies with the terms of pardon. Not trying to merit salvation, but simply showing God you love him and that you have confidence in his system of salvation. So the Bible says, the New Testament in particular, that salvation is in Christ's church. It is in Christ's church because it is the blood-purchased institution. Acts 20 and verse 28. The church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Then again, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. Ye are not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God. Now what was that price? That price was the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So notice. Members of the church of which we read in the New Testament, the Lord's church that he built, Matthew 16, 18, and it started on the day of Pentecost, the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, Acts chapter 2. People who heard the gospel on that day were persuaded by the gospel to believe that Christ is the Son of God. And as believers, he said in verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. This they did when they gladly received his word, verse 41. And verse 42 and 47 makes it clear they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. So we're able to see then it's that church that is blood bought and non-members were not blood bought. So who will say man can be saved apart from? from the blood. The church is the only thing bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what's made clear as Luke records Acts' statement to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20 and verse 28. So we can only conclude that those not in the church have not been blood bought. I do not speak of a denomination. You can read the New Testament through. You can memorize it in Greek. And you can understand it in Greek as well as Paul did. And you can understand it in English. And you will simply not find any church but the church Jesus built that started in Acts 2 that's purchased by the blood of Christ. Denominationalism and that very concept of things arose 1,500 years after the church of our Lord was, uh, was built in Acts chapter 2. So the church was purchased with the blood of Christ. I can only conclude, therefore, if the church is a non-essential institution, then the blood of Christ is non-essential. It's not even worth the purchase price. What a fool that makes out of Jesus Christ. Now, who wants to be guilty of saying that? Every person who says that man can be saved out of the church really brings an indictment against God, that they know more about things than he does and that he's revealed in his word. It's equivalent to charging God with being an unmerciful fiend who used the blood of his son, who he says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, to purchase a worthless and unessential institution. Surely, people who understand the nature of the church is revealed in the New Testament of Christ, the very person who purchased it with his blood. Surely, if they really understood that, they would turn from that false concept. But as long as they have an idea the church doesn't make any difference, you're saved by Christ personally, and you pick the church that's your choice, then they will never have the concept that comes 
by just going by what the New Testament says, that and that only. Salvation is in the church for the inspired apostle Paul promised that Christ would save the church. He hasn't promised to save anything else since this Christian dispensation started. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body, Ephesians 5.23. I've already mentioned Colossians 1.18, where it is plainly said that the body is the church. So Christ is the Savior of the body, or the church, and we dare not contradict that. Salvation is in the church because it's there that man is reconciled to God. When we sinned, we were separated from God. We were lost. There is no way back to God to be saved except through Jesus Christ. Thus, that's why the gospel must be preached to every creature, to give man the knowledge and understanding of how Christ does save. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. John 14, 15. Listen to what he said to the church by Paul, the church at Ephesus. And might reconcile them both in one body unto God through the cross, having slain the enmity, which means hate, having slain the hate thereby, Ephesians 2, 16. Well, now let's see what we've got here. Paul identifies the church to be the body of Christ, Colossians 1, verse 18. Now, we can do a little reasoning. God made us rational creatures, and we need to use our rationality. We need to take the information, see its proper context, find the terms according to the Scriptures, and reason with it. I think that most admit that man must be reconciled to God because man sinned against God. Man separated himself from God. Reconciliation unto God is only in one place. It's in the church or the one body of Christ. Ephesians 2.16, again Colossians 1.18. So is it not easy to conclude? Therefore, one must be in the church. Because that's where he's reconciled. And to be reconciled, to be saved. Saved from your sins. Salvation is in the church because that is the group or institution that Christ will present unto himself. We forget sometimes, and we shouldn't, or we let it maybe become less significant than it ought to be, that we're going to be presented. I say we're. We are the church as it's described, as it's used, as it's defined in the New Testament, going to be presented to, to deity, to God. It's His church. That church is His children, 1 Timothy 3.15. It's the body of Christ, Colossians 1.18. Ephesians 4 says there's only one body. That body is the church. Listen to Ephesians 5, verse 27. That He might present the church to Himself a glorious church. We've spoken several times about each member who's faithful raised on that day into a glorified state. John said, we don't know what we'll be like. We will be like him. But the scripture goes on. He says that church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians 5.27 it is depressing to me as a Christian and especially as a gospel preacher and now serving as an elder for a little while to realize the people can read this from the words of God through Christ revealed by the Holy Spirit and see that it should be without blemish and yet we don't work to that end here. We are not that interested in what the Bible says about each member li living pure lives like the New Testament defines and describes that purity. Christ is going to present the church to himself. And if we are members of the church, faithful to him, then all is well. But if not, you can't describe how bad off it will be. So our only answer to those who would say it doesn't make any difference about what church you're a member of, just so you're sincere, is that that is just so foreign to the New Testament concept of the Lord's church 
that you would think anybody that spends any time in serious Bible study concentrating on the church as it's presented in the New Testament would see through that completely. God has his children and his family. That's the only place he has his family or his children is in his family. The word is the seed of the kingdom. Men are born of water and the spirit. They're added to the church or born into the kingdom. Uh, we would still in this loose, immoral, and immoral age find it terrible to think that somebody says, well, you know, old brother so-and-so, he's a good guy. He's got children in all these different families around here. They don't mind saying that about God continually. Don't mind at all. Man simply cannot be saved out of the church because of what I've said several times, but I'll say it again. God adds the saved to the church. And the Lord added to them, as the American Standard reads, day by day, those that were saved, Acts 2, 47. King James simply says, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. If one has to be a child in the family of God to be saved, he has to be a member of God's church to be saved. Listen to what Paul said. Speaking to Timothy, who would know these things, believe them and obey them, and as a preacher, preach them to others. He said to Timothy, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Language couldn't be plainer. If we say the Bible's the word of God, we want to know God's word on this matter. Could it be plainer on this matter? The church is the family of God. People who have the seed of the kingdom sown, that is, they believe it, Luke 8 and verse 11 and verse 15, and they follow it, they're born in the kingdom, John 3, 3 and 5. That is, they're added to the church. They're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 27. So the house of God is the church of God. And the house is the family. When the scripture says in the case of conversions of the jailer that he and his house, Acts 16, 29 through 34 in that case, he and his house were Converted, we don't think of the structure being converted, but we know it meant those that were of his house, his family, as a family was constituted. People old enough to hear the gospel, understand it, believe it, and obey it. We also read that the Corinthians feared God with all his house, or Cornelius, I'm sorry. Cornelius feared God with all his house. Same thing I would say about him, Acts 10 2, that I would say about, or did say about, the Corinthians, or said about the jailer. Man cannot be saved out of the church Jesus built because he cannot be saved without being a branch in the vine. Jesus, in speaking to his disciples, said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Denominations have tried to say, Jesus is the vine, and the different denominations are the branches. But he plainly comes out and says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. And he says, if a man abide in me, he say if a church abides in me. Talking about individual Christians. When you believe and obey the gospel, you're raised to walk in newness of life, having been added to the church by the Lord himself. So if you abide in him, well, how do you abide in the branch? Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain. Where? In the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So man cannot be saved apart from this plant. Jesus said in the fifth verse of James 15, apart from me you can do nothing. And we mentioned that this morning relative to people saying, well, all you have to do to be acceptable to God is live a good moral life. And we saw the reasons that can't be so this morning. It's impossible to be saved out of the church, which we read the New Testament, the church Jesus built, the church he purchased with his own blood, the church to which he adds all those who are saved from their sins. That's the case because it's impossible to be saved without being justified. 
false into the church in Rome concerning justification. That is, in God's eyes, you're justified. He said, and whom he called, that's the gospel call, he justified. Them he also justified. When you stand before the Lord on that great day, if you do not stand before him justified, you stand before him unjustified. You stand before him condemned. You either never obeyed the gospel or else you obeyed it and quit living like the Bible said. Some form or fashion. And that's in Romans 8 and verse 30. You were called in one body. Colossians 3.15. But Colossians 1 in verse 18 says the body is the church. And Ephesians 4 says there's one church or one body. And so we see why we need to let the Bible do the designating and the defining. So first of all, the called are justified. The called are in the body of Christ, which is the church. So our conclusion is that the justified are in the church. How could you conclude otherwise? So this makes it plain, I think, that if any man is not in the church, then guess what? He does not stand justified in God's sight. It's impossible to be saved out of the church of which we read in the New Testament. And there's a reason for that, another reason for that. Because it's impossible to be saved without being delivered out of the power of darkness. Now, I cannot deliver myself of my own ingenuity, my own philosophy, any works of righteousness that I've done from the power of darkness. I cannot do it. Listen to what is said, though, to the church in Colossae, in Colossians 1 and verse 13. Concerning them who delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, or God's dear Son. Now, of course, that destroys the idea that the kingdom of Christ is in our future because those people at that time who received that letter, as well as the author of it, Paul, were already in the kingdom. And we see that the kingdom is the church. He used the terms interchangeably when he said, Upon this rock I'll build my church in Matthew 16, 18, 19. We are delivered out of the power of darkness when humbly we receive with meekness and grafted word the seed of the kingdom. And we believe it and we obey it. So those not in the kingdom have not been delivered out of the power of darkness. They're still caught up in a lost, separated condition, not justified and not reconciled to God. People out of the kingdom or church are in need of having their eyes opened. Listen to this, that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive remission of sins and inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith in me. I do not know how much is revealed as I stand here right now, in the Old Testament that typifies Christ saving all men by the gospel in His church. I do know, as I said in the beginning, that nobody would say, well, yeah, there were people saved from the great flood in Noah's day who were not on the ark. That is ridiculous. Well, it's no more ridiculous than saying people are saved by Christ today from their sins and justified and uh, reconciled outside the ark of safety of today, which is the church, the one body of Christ. Language couldn't be clearer. You remember another one, and that is the Levitical priesthood and the worship of the Jews under the law of Moses and the tabernacle, and later it was the temple. But there was in that tabernacle the holy place, and then there was the most holy place, also known as the holy of holies. I know that types can be, or shadows of things to come, can be carried too far. It seems that the scriptures warn our saying that the holy place was a type of the church. And you know, you had to, the priests had to wash in the labor before they could go in and minister into the holy place. And there's where the altar of incense was, which represents prayers. There's where the table of showbread was that they took off. And only those priests could do it. Well, who are the priests of God today? Why, the priests of God today are God's children, members of the body of Christ. And that's very important to understand. And that was simply a type of those things to come as members 
of the church who are each one priests and we go to our heavenly father through our high priest the only mediator between God and man Jesus Christ look at Hebrews chapter 8 9 and 10 that's all we can say at this point but read them thoroughly along this line and you'll see that's how the Holy Spirit used these things from the Old Testament to teach uh, Jewish Christians in the New Testament the point is simply this they had to go through the holy place to get into the most holy place no way they could do it otherwise. Most holy place typified heaven. The holy place typified the church. Only the priest, after washing, could go into the holy place. Then only the high priest, once a year, could go into the most holy place to offer blood for the sins of, of himself and all the people. So the Bible teaches in type that man must go through the church to get into heaven. That's how those things written before time were written for our learning. That's why that you have Galatians 3.24 that the law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. If you understood those things, then you understand a lot that was taught to the Jews to convert them to Christ. Because I can read the book of Hebrews and say that's exactly how they taught about the tabernacle and about the design and purpose of the law and that it was a shadow of good things to come. So it is that we come to the end of this that salvation is in Christ's church. That church is His body. It is his kingdom. It is his family. One must hear the gospel, believe it, and from the heart obey it, and be baptized into Christ. Into what? Into Christ. Into his church. Galatians 3.27. And there's only one way to heaven, through the church. Let's say that again. There's only one way to heaven in this Christian dispensation. That is through the church. There's no way into the church except by the power of God to save men from sin. And that's the gospel. For us in the church, that ought to tell us why we need to be doing all we can to sow the seed of the kingdom, to preach the word, to preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, 15. Because it is by that gospel that men come to understand the way of salvation and the significance and importance of the church. And it destroys denominationalism. I think if all that's going on, even the immorality of today, and all the atheism of today, the one of the greatest tools, if not the greatest tool, that the devil's used to reap souls for himself has been denominationalism. Making people belittle the church. Because you can't get to heaven except through the church. Any more than one could get into the most holy place of the tabernacle except through the holy place. If you're not a child of God, we hope that you'll see fit to become one. I don't know how I could go through how one becomes a child anymore, and I have this whole sermon. As a child of God, if you've sinned, you need to repent of your sins, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness. But as long as we have breath and our bodies and our mind works, then we're capable of hearing and understanding the truth and bringing ourselves in subjection to it. And we trust if anybody needs to do that, they'll do it now while we stand and